Hi, everybody. We've got, we've got an interesting setup here uh, that I think you're going to be really, really excited by. My name is James Glisson. For those of you who don't know me, I am the somewhat new curator of contemporary art, and it is my extraordinary pleasure to uh, welcome Edgar Arsenault, um, an LA artist of international renown, here physically to the galleries here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. It's me and Edgar, um, and we've got Elena Hancock uh, helping us out. So there's three of us in the space, properly socially distanced, and we've got a really interesting conversation for you today. Uh, before I, I'm gonna say a little bit about Edgar, but I also wanna thank some people who made this possible. I wanna thank the, the Museum Contemporaries, a support group I work with. I wanna thank Julie Joyce, because we're here thanks to Julie's show that we're in. In the meanwhile, part one, it highlights a lot of brilliant acquisitions that Julie made during her long and really productive and meaningful tenure here at the museum. And it's been my honor to steward the show and steward this event because this was Julie, uh, Julie's idea. I can't claim it. Um, uh, Rachel Heidendry con contributed to that show immensely. Um, and the staff of education here, Elena, who I mentioned, Patsy Hicks and Christy Thomas have all pulled, pulled together to make this happen. But um, we're most grateful to Edgar, um, who's uh, came all the way up from LA in the time of COVID to do this. Um, Edgar's exhibited at the Hammer, the Whitney Biennial, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and many, many other places. He's an associate professor at the Roski School of Fine Arts uh, at USC. He lives and works in Pasadena. From 1999 to 2012, he had a major role in the founding of and was the founding director of the Watts House Project in the Watts section of LA, where among many other things, he and a team of people worked to help expand and make renovations and improvements to home through upkeeps. And it's been described as an artist-driven neighborhood redevelopment organization. Um, his work is really hard to, hard to pen down, but in the best possible way. But I'm going to try to do that very briefly. Um, he's worked in painting, and uh, he's a painter, he's a drawer, he's a dramaturge, he's a writer. Um, he's really good with sound equipment. Uh, he's amazingly good at sound equipment and with tech stuff. This is an example of an art, his artwork right here behind us, and another one. Um, but what 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 his work does, and I think he's going to enact this today, is his work is like a wormhole that connects disparate points of time. And there's a quote by the German Jewish uh, literary, uh, literary uh, kind of essayist, Walter Benjamin, that I think starts to get at the complexity of Edgar's work. Benjamin wrote in the late 1920s that the work of memory collapses time. Let me say that one more time. The work of memory collapses time. And I think a lot of what, um, in, a, in a very super meta way, a lot of what makes the work um, magical and, uh, and tough and eye-opening is that it reveals all these kinds of holes in our cognitive landscapes, all the things that I'm, and I, here I'll speak for myself, the things that I don't associate with each other and that I don't usually put together. And many of these narratives turn, I think, on the way, um, not all of them, but on the way race and racial politics is both uh, central to the United States and what happens here, but is constantly kind of dispersed and deferred and misrepresented. Um, and I could go on and on about his accolades and what he's done, but I would rather turn it over to him because he's he's why we're all here today. So thank you, Edgar. Uh, it's a today's um, conversation between the between the two of us and, and you all out there is a bit of an experiment. So I'm going to be going to be chatting today. I'm going to be talking about the, the two drawings behind us. I'll also be doing some uh, some drawings. Um, and some diagrams as well, just to help to, to ground some of the, the concepts that, that we'll be exploring today. But we'll be we'll be doing the thing that I've, I've actually wanted to do, which is to um, not only draw a 
connections and points between disparate um, disparate things um, that have our, that are actually deeply related, but uh, form a conversation as well. Um, and uh, you know, you can't put everything in the drawing. So these kinds of experiences are really um, enjoyed because it allows us to kind of get into the weeds and some of the complexities. Um, as well as some of the ideas that are actually not in the work but are um, peripheral to it, mm -hmm. or the things that are in the background of how it was made, but you don't really get to know that stuff, like when you're mm -hmm. um, chatting with uh, with the artists themselves. So hopefully you guys like this. Um, okay, so the sound isn't coming through. The sound is choppy. Sound is. Is it? Is it still? Are we? Are you guys still having a hard time? I hear. I see. Me? Crystal Jones says better. So I think better, we're thank you. Okay, yeah, just keep us, keep us, keep letting us know. We can yeah. we can adjust things. Um so yes, but also yeah, so thanks to Julie Joyce, you know, for yes. bringing us together. Julie and I have known each other, I think, for almost 20 years. And I um, also want to give a special shout out to one of my uh, my thought uh, partners and uh, collaborators, Julia Myers, who um, over the last 10 years of us exploring Detroit and spending time there. Um, yeah, it's going to echo a little bit because we're inside of a, of a big cavernous room. But, um, um, but, you know, we've done, yeah, Julie and I have done a lot, of, a lot of work together around this subject. So, special um, shout out to him. So, I'm going to transition it over here. You know, what I wanted to, to lay out is some, some key concepts and then be able to move to this drawing over here to the, um, to the dead man um, drawing uh, as well. So, you know, my first question to you guys is, um, what is the, the, for you, like, what is the difference between a loop and a cycle? So, um, so the difference is that loops are, tend to be closed, where cycles actually are, uh, are open. But um, these things tend to be closed in, in, into themselves. The cycles are uh, yes. considered closed. So, why is cycle back? The stories have not changed. Um, I'm going to come back to show you an example of what I mean by that. Um, you know, the term that I've been using for this cycle is, uh, is the lower cycle. So the, the lower cycle is what I'm calling it. Um, it's a constant um, thing, and it's, and it's ever changing. And if you go, what is lower, um, if you add the word folk in front of it, then that kind of gives you a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, so this, this drawing that's over here on the wall, so this is a drawing of, uh, of Sean Penn from the movie Dead Man Walking. Um, this is a movie of a, of a mummy from a Boris Karloff uh, film. And it says, uh, this one says Dead Man Walking, Walking Dead Man. And then this one is a poster of a day at the dead celebration. Um, and it says a uh, man walking dead. It's like an old um, ancient uh, poster. Um, so, with these three images, um, we have a, and this is a, a very rudimentary uh, uh, drawing here, but you have, uh, you know, uh, Sean Penn uh, here, right, looking kind of somber as he's being marched to the, uh, uh, to the gas chamber, um, where he's about to get a lethal injection in the movie. And he was, he was convicted uh, for murder and, he was able to find redemption, but for some reason, they kind of turned him into a kind of a Christ-like figure. Um, then you have the, the mummy here, and then in this image, um, you have a, uh, um, a petrified uh, uh, mummy um, from the Day of the Dead. So these three objects came together in this drawing And uh, man, walking dead man is in the middle, yeah, and then a uh, man walking dead, yeah. Um, your writing is clear, thank you. Technology is amazing. Um, so I think that brought these three images together, 
was actually uh, a chance, sort of a coincidence. This, um, I, I was watching this movie and it, I realized that they had painted Sean Penn's character in a way in which not only was he uh, being redeemed, right? Um, redeemed, but he also was being redeemed in a way which seemed very particular and uh, to being a, uh, you know, a white man, as someone whom, you know, they commit a crime that at the end of their life, they can still be seen, not only as redemptive, but also as being Christ-like. And I thought this was very interesting because around that same time, I had encountered this poster of Boris Karloff as a man who was uh, um, trapped in purgatory not only after pur purgatory, but trapped in purgatory forever. But that this story actually plays a lot of kind of these old um, racist ideas about Africa and the Middle East and the, and the dark, the dark parts of the dark um, And I probably, because this was made so long ago, all this probably came together around the Day of the Dead Festival. <laughs> and um, the idea of people actually living and celebrating um, life through death, to me, um, became a much more healthy kind of example. But you have to say, like, well, how are these three things related? What I imagine myself doing in my uh, in my practice is that I'm I'm standing in a position, and I have my arm extended, and I'm pointing to you. What I see is three events that are moving through this lore cycle, um, and that is producing a picture that says something about the present. Right? And it also begs the question why is this then? Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? So, this is a series of drawings that I made over three to four year period of time. The power pen is full screen. So this, this last drawing, um, which is a question, um, this is a, uh, a, uh, a rendering of a poster from, uh, from a Day of the Dead um, festival that was probably 100 years old. Um, that I found in the book. And I was making all of this work before the internet existed, so. <laughs> but this, this idea of the lore cycle is something which is not, um, uh, an understanding, it's, a, it's an understanding of time that forces us to think about it a little bit differently um, than we're conventionally taught. So normally we think about time as a line, right, between two points. So uh, 1968, 1967, you know, 1965, 1964, either going yeah. forward or back in time. But because the lore cycle actually moves in recurrences, it forces us to think about time not as a line, but more as a time scape, right? So not a timeline, but a time scape in a similar way that we look at a landscape. Um, so to, to use this model as a way to then uh, transition to the, to the larger uh, topic um, for our conversation, um, we are going to be uh, exploring um, Detroit and it's uh, it's uprising um, that happened in uh, 1967. And then four years later, when the artist uh, Michael Heiser did a uh, project in that very same city in 1971, we're going to explore what happened in this time frame between these two moments as a way to then triangulate to um, an earthwork that he's been working on out in the middle of the desert um, called City Complex. 
that um, he began working on one year after this project called Drag Mass Displacement um, became a, a work of, of anthony and was literally blown up by uh, by dynamite. Um, so here's the here's the model. We're going to talk about these projects, um, thinking about them in relationship to time that recycles, that cycles back around again, um, and thinking about cycles in relationships to the lore cycle, which is why things keep returning, is because those conditions have changed very much as a change. In 1967, um, uh, up right after the Detroit, um, as an example of the lower cycle, um, and I was a four year old at the time, and I was still by the National Guard, I was sent to Detroit to squash this event. Um, and I was still by the National Guard, and they thought that her, uh, um, that cigarette pipe was being uh, turned on and a window for the cycle. Um, and that child was killed, but no charge. Uh, in 2020, he decided yesterday that the Alvin Taylor was shot in the home by the police. Um, uh, we're not charged. And protests are happening right now as we, as we speak. So the, the lure cycle uh, continues when those conditions um, have not been changed. Um, so just a little more backstory here. So when I first traveled to, to Detroit you know, back in uh, 2000, in 2006, um, 2007, um, we wanted to go to the site where the Detroit riots uh, had begun, or what you could call the Detroit uprising. And what we were surprised to learn was that the site um, was completely erased. The building where um, the uprising began was uh, demolished, and there was no marker the, the industry, um, that this is the flashpoint that uh, set off one of the largest sort of social unrest events in the history of the United States, and actually one of the most violent. Um, the only thing that sat there uh, was this giant sculpture that had no name on it. And we were really intrigued by that um, and wanted to know, uh, wanted to know why. Um, these are some examples of what was left over after those events um, that almost two week period of time uh, where people had, had enough. Um, the events of the, of the riot, or the uprising, began um, in a basement park. Yeah, a number of Vietnam veterans who had just um, returned back um, from a tour um, were in a, uh, a, 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 um, inside of a party um, known as a blind pig. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Blind Pig, but essentially there were underground racial establishments in Detroit. Because the city was segregated, there weren't really any bars for, for Black people to go to and to, um, to socialize. So they created their own, these illegal drinking establishments. And this one was filled uh, to the brim with, you know, close to 100 people. Um, and when the police raided it that night, they decided to arrest everybody. Um, so people inside of the neighborhood started coming out. And it even, so this took several hours for them to arrest all the people. And then by the end, folks started saying, you know, are we going to continue to take this shit? We're not going to take this anymore. And when the last police cruiser um, drove off, the story goes that a bottle flew through the window. And then that was the beginning of the event um, that set Detroit on fire. This is uh, a drawing that I made of that, uh, of that blind pig that site um, where that sculpture was located. Um, so this is me imagining that site in that basement, like what used to be there, but that it's so much deeper than the strata actually allows it. So this, um, um, this drawing was me responding to that, the emptiness of that site, imagining that basement being far deeper um, mm. than the, uh, that it could physically be on this mm. giant stratum of earth floating through space. And because the building doesn't exist and there's no record that I could find, I just drew it based on what I imagined. It so inverting that structure, showing both what is there now and then what might have been there. But as, a, as an artist and a curator wandering around the city of Detroit, we start thinking about just how fantastical a place this is. Uh, because even though we were there in the in the 1990s, in the mid 1990s, 
many of those buildings that had burned up in 1967 um, were still there. So they actually, many of them are still there. Um, mm -hmm. burned out state, where trees and bushes and things started to grow back into the. Um, it's it's unless you've been there, it's, it's difficult to like describe mm -hmm. just how big mm -hmm. uh, the city is. But it was a city that was built around the industrialization, it was built around the Ford Motor Car um, Company. Um, so in '67, when this thing happened, um, there was a uh, so it was in the artist, different ideas to the city. And one of those efforts was to invite this artist, uh, Michael Heiser, who is a uh, earthwork artist, a, a seminal earthwork artist, who've done pieces that you've probably seen before, like the levitated mass yeah. um, that's at Boca, the yeah. big giant boulder. Yeah. Um, but before then, when he was a young man here, you can see him giving burn, uh, was kind of his spirit. He was out in the desert doing some really interesting stuff, you know, digging holes in the ground, holes without history, mm -hmm. um, taking giant stones and dragging them across the ground. But when he was invited mm -hmm. in 1971 to come to Detroit and to do one of these interventions, it collided in a city that was uh, full of holes with history. This is that work, uh, drag mass uh, displacement. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know the story, it's worth doing some research yeah. into it because it's, it's super, super interesting. Yeah. And this is the place where like an artist's intentions collide um, with, uh, with the reality of, uh, of, the, of the city. So, you know, when an ideal form yeah. collides with, uh, it's, uh, with the non it's, it's also a moment when a curator's ambitions collide with the ambitions of the, their, their museum. Mm -hmm. So Sam Wagstaff, who commissioned this, uh, got had a lot of fallout from it that he had to deal with but you keep yeah. going yeah, yeah. Anyway. So, so he invited michael Heiser, who at the time was 26 years old and he was like super hot um as a uh, as an artist i think at the time he was on the cover of time magazine as one of these people who had abandoned uh, the the gallery scene and went out and worked in the desert like with artists like nancy holtz you guys may be familiar with the sun tunnels that are yeah. um in nevada or with um uh, Robert Smith and Spiral Jetty. These are people who were going out to, to leave essentially kind of politics and, and culture behind and then trying to, in, you know, inquire into a, a space that exists not in like cultural or social time, but in the in geological time, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with elements that seem to be, um, you know, connecting with eons of, of history. Um, but what Michael Heiser and then also Sam uh, Wagstaff, the curator, didn't account for was that people didn't see this work that he was doing, which the idea was to drag it back and forth across the, uh, the earth until the thing became submerged into the ground. If you can imagine it like a, if you're a printmaker and you're dragging a stylus across a metal plate, you put in grave into the ground and then slide into the earth, and then that dirt would pile on top, and it would grow on the earth, and then over time it would just like sink back into the ground again. But what he didn't account for was that the composition of the soil in Detroit was so dense that it um, uh, just slid back and forth across the ground. So as a, in a moment of uh, desperation. It took these uh, these bulldozers and then just dumped it on top. So when people encountered this work, they just saw it as another scar on the face of the city. And the community was so outraged by it um, that they told Heiser that he had to come and remove the piece even before the show was closed. He disavowed the work and disappeared. Sam Wagstaff, the curator, who, if you guys aren't familiar, he was the one who put Robert Mapledorf on the map, um, the photographer Robert Mapledorf, um, was forced to resaw the lawn at the cost of $10,000. And then uh, yep. several months later, the protest, he wound up um, resigning from the museum. So this drawing that I made here called the mm -hmm. uh, Drag Mass and Allegory, um, 
which is the uh, this is about five feet long. Um, it's me exploring that history, but thinking about the way in which it collided um, with the uh, with the soldier history of Detroit and turning it into a kind of an allegory, um, not only of the artist's um, attempt uh, to do something mythical, do something ancient um, within a city that didn't want it, um, but the way in which it collided with the, the narrative of social unrest and uh, the way in which allegory oftentimes is a tool which is um, used to, uh, to subjugate people. Because when people think about Detroit today, mm. oftentimes they imagine mm. it as a city that was both the promise of the, the promise of the middle class, the way in which industrialization and these uh, these jobs, you know, making uh, cars and uh, automobile parts and you know manufacturing would, would transform the middle class perpetually. And Detroit was that model, but now we also see it as the failure of that dream. Now, if you think about it in relationship to that map of time that I had there, um, you can think about how you know that that. Uh, that promise is and, uh, the way in which it sort of seeped itself into the larger kind of socioeconomic reality that COVID has uh, exposed um, today. Um, now, this is my speculation, and this is what this drawing line is exploring, is that what happened after um, this event, when Heiser disavowed this work, when his idealized met a non a non ideal space of the of the city, you know, sort of being torn apart by this uh, um, unjust socioeconomic reality that were uh, subjugated blacks and, and working class people shipping jobs overseas. What happens to a person when they go through that kind of trauma, especially in the mid twenties? Well, my speculation is is that a year later, when they started working on a new project called City Complex in 1972, right in the middle of the Nevada desert, that this was him making a work in response um, to a uh, collision um, within the city of Detroit. So uh, how many of you are familiar with this, this work about the city? I am. Have you been down there before? I have not been there. I visited it like you, probably through Google Maps. Um, I mean, Curious to see where you're going to take this. I always read that I've read this as a disavow of the city and a way to kind of erase all of the, the you know, all of the complexities and all the problems that he encountered with this project in Detroit. He has this uh, total control in the desert. Um, at least that in his mind, he has total control. But that doesn't seem to be exactly where you're going with this. Am I right? Not that good. I mean, I think that the control is clear. So yeah. part of the, the mythology of this the piece is that there's a there's a fence around it and it's some highly secured, I mean, partially because it's dangerous to be in there, but um, also because he wants no one to have access to it at all. So it's sort of like the, the ultimate artist studio, um, mm -hmm. except, you know, it's $150 million uh, that's invested in developing by major institutions like the DO and the LA County Museum of Art um, that have uh, created what's now considered the largest um, artwork in the history of the world. Um, but just how big is this thing? So this, this object here um, is, uh, is, uh, is that the same one? This object here, I think is, uh, maybe it might be over here. <laughs> I'm not exactly certain where that one is. It might be this location. Okay. Um, but just to give you a sense of it, um, the steps of the, of the scale, um, this uh, uh, complex is made up of simple elements, triangles, mounds, slopes, etchings, musabas. I'm not sure what a musaba is. I was not able to actually find what the, what a definition was. But this is how big it is. And please forgive the- uh, They're the Sumerian. They're Sumerian? Yeah, structures. they're Sumerian structures. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I need to come here to find out. Um, but this is this is how big these things are. I mean, they are absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. um, these structures are probably 20, 25 feet tall on their end, made of concrete. Um, these forms are uh, made of concrete and then surrounded by different forms of gravel mm -hmm. and, uh, and railings. 
I mean, and it is, you know, uh, to me, a pretty, pretty marvelous yeah. part. This is where most people might know how to be uh, transported this uh, multi-ton um, object uh, from a quarry now suspended over the heads of uh, people who walk underneath it. You know, when he decided to make this work, he was partially inspired by going to um, Machu Picchu and uh, mm. seeing um, uh, the pyramids uh, out in the, in the, in the Mayan uh, uh, jungles of, uh, of Mexico. But he wanted to make something epic, something that was big. And I think mm. also something that felt as though it was um, completely ancient. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as well. But the thing that I wanted to do was to draw a connection between these ancient forms, these triangles and these mounds, and show that there was a shadow that connected uh, Detroit and Detroit Steel, you know, over 2,000 miles back to the, to the floor of, uh, of the Nevada desert um, as a way of uh, modeling. Um, this uh, this idea. Okay. That so it's, um, somewhere in the shift in you the space okay. of uh, of the gap, right? The space between these uh, these pyramidal forms that are out in Nevada. And there's a gap here, and that this gap isn't empty, right? But it's actually full of uh, of history, right? But the only way that which you can experience this gap is by me, to the best of my ability, trying to place you in that space, so that you can get a sense of the magnitude of not only of, uh, of these two thousand miles, right, but also of this uh, fifty years of change that America has gone through, which is both uh, um, political, social, and um, economic. Oh, so you have a question. Okay. Okay. The lack of market at the site of Detroit riots resonates with lack of market at Sleepy Lagoon, oh. start of the Zoo 2 riots in LA. Yeah, thank you, Joy. Um, yeah, I mean, these, uh, these are like sort of rich opportunities um, for us to be able to, uh, to locate um, where these events happen. Mm -hmm. but I, would, I would say, Joy, like if, if, um, if you're, you know, interested in trying to do something to to locate that site, I guess uh, the, the challenge I will put to you is um, how do you address like this key question, which is um, if this if this moment in history is returning into the present, like what is it doing here now? Like why is it asserting itself at this moment as opposed to you know a myriad of other events or other things that have been forgotten? Why is this one important at this moment? I feel like if you're if you're able to address that. Yeah. Um, in the market, or in the work, in the project, and it's able to um, to really kind of kind of connect. Walter Benjamin was not the person I would have gone to initially, but he's this he's this incredibly unusual combination of Marxist economics and Marxist thinking, with um, a fair bit of mysticism and interested interest in mythopoetics and. And Marx's reading of things, you know, the, the, the Benjamin's reading of the, a cyclical idea of history, it's not that any of these things ever, what you're trying to say, I think, in response to the question and with other, with your work, is it's not that these things have ever gone away. They've always been late, and they've always, latent in terms, or not late, that sounds like they're, like they're passive, that's the wrong word. They're always present. It's that the cycles of attention that are paid to them change. So the underlying conditions are just there. Um, economic inequality, um, racism, um, um, uh, structural racism against black people. Mm. All of that remains the same, but there seem to be these cycles in which certain 
events precipitate paying attention to those. Yeah. And we're in one of those right now. Yeah. Um, and but what's inter- what I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is this drawing a moment in that gap? Is that drawing a way to illustrate the like moments when there is not silence, but there's not the same amount of kind of attention paid to these underlying issues? Is that one way to frame it? You can tell me now. You can say that's off. Well, no, no, it's not, it's not off. I mean, and I mean, these drawings are pretty abstract, but I was always trying to place the word Detroit um, in the work in a place where um, it felt like this work was looking towards that horizon and that it was always there. Right, but it's yeah. just kind of abstracted, right? And and in my reading, like whenever I'm looking at these wedges, these triangles, and these mounds, um, I can't help but think about Detroit wedges or Detroit steel, you know, like these, um, you know, these, uh, you know, it's kind of like a metaphor when you go there and, and and you meet people, you know, who talk about what Detroit was and what Detroit is now, and oftentimes like you know, it's, it's manufacturing history has kind of become a metaphor for the endurance and the strength um, of them. Um, so, you know, like just thinking about that endurance and that strength, I, I, I tend to kind of think of it almost like a kind of a triangle, right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strong kind of archetypal form. So when I'm looking at these objects and, and Heiser's um, city, like I can't help but think about you know, what might have inspired them with this, this collision that happened with, uh, with Detroit. And then, you know, there's a lot of big open spaces in Detroit. There's a lot of desolation, but there's also um, a lot of density where amazing artists and cultural producers and, you know, farmers and business people, like they're really, you know, investing in the city and bringing richness um, to it and have done that um, historically, you know, before the uprising in 67, as well as as um as afterwards but i'm just trying to draw this this idea that this shadow that's extending from these forms actually reaches all the way back to the city itself of detroit so it's it's a uh, so would it be right to say that the there's a kind of melancholy to this piece mm-hmm. and it, and your your acknowledgement of Heiser's uh, trend, but like that experience he had was a bad, yeah. ex- like bad experience. Yeah. Um, am I reading into this too much? It's like the kind of brooding, there's a there's a sort of brooding quality. I've described it in, in other moments, I think of it as being lunar, like mm. we're on, on the, the surface of the moon. But maybe maybe another way to read it is, is uh, that dark brooding quality is um, you know, Detroit in the distance, a failed project that he disavowed, um, uh, mm-hmm. the kind of dreamscape of what was to come in the decades ahead as he, uh, the earth movers moved and the uh, mm-hmm. concrete was laid in and all mm-hmm. of the stuff that happened. And I think mm-hmm. the piece is, in fact, it was supposed to open to the public of all years this year. This year, yeah. Of all years. Yeah. But what, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll speak to that, and then also, you know, the the title of the talk was um, Detroit Riots, Black Lives Matters, and um, where art and politics collide. So, um, and 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 I do want to make sure we have enough time to talk about this, the point of BLL. Um, but you know, I was thinking that these were all taking place at night, and that these were you know being illuminated by a kind of by a kind of moonlight. Um, and you, some of you who are familiar with Hydra's work may know what his drawings look like. And this is, this is very reminiscent of a kind of very rough hewn style of, uh, of drawing um, that he did. So this was me just trying to, to form another layer of conversation um, with him. Um, but just because we have a couple minutes of time, I wanted to, to talk about Black Lives Matters as well. And like how, what in the world does any of this have to do um, with what we were talking about. And, and maybe some of you have, are, are picking up on it, but you know, this, um, uh, uh, this moment between 67 um, to 71 to 1972, um, when Hydra's working in the desert to 2020, um, there's lots of other 
moments of, of art historical moments that are also responding to these conditions. Um, and one of those movements is Black Lives Matter. And I wanted to talk about it, particularly for the artists that are more um, or the creatives that are in the room, because what most people don't know is that Black Lives Matters actually started as a performance art collective. Um, they were doing um, the, the performances where they would, you know, go into a restaurant and then, you know, they would start reading the, the names of, of, uh, of Black people that were killed by the police. You know, just simply like asking the question, like, why is it that their lives being lost don't really matter to people like you? Um, and they did that um, for years, just as a as an art collective. Um, but it wasn't until um, you know a, a, a few years ago, I think around the time that um, that Donald Trump was elected. I could be a, a little soft around these these dates. That it actually started to catalyze into more of a uh, of a political uh, movement or a politically sort of organized um initiative but what what black lives matters um recognizes is that they are standing on the shoulders they're building on the inheritance of people like angela davis you know and medgar evers and you know the folks who are acting during this time that were saying that the police are the problem yeah. right that the police need to be defunded that the um institutions that we have are suffering um, because the police are being overfunded and everyone else is being underfunded. Um, so Black Lives Matters now, which is, uh, has become so emblematic, like to see NBA players and football players and hockey league players actually wearing this stuff on their shirts is, um, to me, it's just confounding and it's also kind of remarkable um, uh, to see how this has kind of taken on and become a global phenomenon. But the event that happened in 1967 um, in, uh, in Detroit, the, the, the Watts uprising that happened in 1965, it also happened in 1968 in, in Paris, you know, and in the 60s it had happened in South America. You know, so these things were, are part of a global movement, but the lore cycle has brought it back around again, right? Except now it's sort of, it's learned and our, you know, conservative government is doing everything that it can to continue to play these old dog whistle tricks yeah. of turning the working class against the working class. Um, and, you know, and it, it appears to, to still be a, a very effective um, instrument uh, for political control. So as you said before, the conditions, what's going on hasn't changed. The conditions have not changed. Yeah, the conditions have not changed. Anything else you want to on? No, I just I just want to say thank you to everyone who uh, who came out and um, participated. Um, I'm hoping to do another defund the police convening in LA. So if you guys um, want, you can follow me on Instagram. It's up uh, Edgar underscore three T H R E E, um, and uh, start following me on Instagram, and he'll be able to keep he'll be able to keep up with the stuff that I'm doing there as well as other shows and things like that. But a thank you to you. Um, to I want to James. plug his website. If you Google his name, it's the third or fourth thing up on Google. Uh, it's an incredible practice. It's also an activist practice and you can learn a lot more. It's a beautiful site, beautiful set of work. Yeah, thank you. I'm so yeah. happy to have you. Hey, thank Lauren you Sellers us. was here, my buddy, curator from the UK. Good to see you, man. Um, okay, thank you all for coming and uh, stay in touch. Okay, stay safe out there.